on. Um, and I just hate not seeing you guys. Okay. So, Russia and the spread of Eastern Orthodox Christianity. So, the beginnings of Russia. And this stuff, this is not like test quiz material yet. You're going to see when we get there. Um, Russia and where we're talking about is going to be this red circled area here. So, this red circle is the land we're talking about for now. And it's lightly tan. Uh, so, about 500 AD, we're going to have the Slavs going from Eastern um from Eastern Europe, um, moving further east to fine land. And they live near the Volga River. This happened around 500. And by 600, we see they have a huge area of land that they're controlling. Hooray. And then what happens is these people are going to start creating all of these little towns and trading posts along the Volga River. And one of the primary people they're going to trade with is the Byzantine Empire. Because if you follow these rivers down, you get into the Black Sea. And then, of course, we have Constantinople right there. So we're going to have lots of trade. Things like fur, things like honey. And trees are going to be an incredibly important thing. Because, of course, we know that the Eastern Roman Empire, our Byzantine Empire, has a lot of cities. And remember, cities, if you think of a city, you probably don't think a whole bunch of trees. Now, uh, during the winter, they'd use and pull sleds. I'm not going to like test you on something like that. And what happened is the Vikings from Scandinavia are going to wind up going and trading with these Slavs and eventually intermarrying and becoming the Russian people we have today. Uh, but what I love is they called the Vikings Varangi Varangians. Uh, and those Varangians are going to be buff and tough. This is what we see in the picture right here facing us. Those would be Vikings later become the Varangians, and the Byzantine emperor is going to wind up seeing them and say, whoa, I need these guys as my bodyguards. And so what's really cool, one of my favorite parts about the Byzantine history is that the emperor had his own special guard, the Varangian guard, and um, at some point, yes, they have giant battle axes that are like the two-sided comical things. Uh, this is what they typically look like right there, but let's see if I can get a good Varangian guard. Um, with the giant, awesome battle axe. They were famous for these big uh, axes that they have here. Oh, gosh, golly. Where is it? I used to have a picture of it, and it was really, really cool, the giant axes that are comically huge. But uh, that was the Varangian Guard, and something that they're going to have for the rest of Byzantine history, which is really cool. Anyways, moving on. So we get to what's called the Kievian Rus. Uh, and the Kievian Rus uh, is going to be the proto-Russian state, meaning the first Russians that we're going to have right here. And it's going to start with a guy named Rurik. And uh, Rurik is going to be the prince of a place of Novgorod. Uh, and he is going to start expanding his territory, start conquering. This is Rurik right there. Yes, extremely handsome. No, London, he is way too old for you. And he's also dead. Sorry. Now, he and his buddy Oleg, because you have the coolest names when you're talking about Russia, found the city of Kiev. Kiev today is the capital of Ukraine uh, and is a separate country today. But for most of this early history, Ukraine, a.k.a. Kiev and Novgorod, are going to be together. And that is going to be our Kievian Rus, our first Russian state. Uh, and this spot was awesome. Just like how we always talk about this, it's location, location, location. So Kiev is going to be right here. All right. I know it's kind of tough to see and small on this map. And this brown arrow is the trade routes that are happening. And you see Kiev is right by it. North of Kiev, almost all of this is just like a bunch of trees. Like seriously, Poland, uh, we have it. Polotsky is uh, right there. Um, just a huge forest at this time. Then we have mountains going around as well. And so it's this narrow area, the steppes of Asia, where everyone goes. And, of course, these people are going to become super duper rich. So um, basically, Rurik ruled as a grand prince. It's a prince. And he has a bunch of principalities, all these lesser princes below him. Uh, these people were called boyers, the rich landowners. Once again, like I said, this is not like stuff I'm going to test you on. Okay? It's not. We're going to get to that when we get to the Cyrillic and Eastern Orthodox. This is just the background for us to understand it. They had their own assembly. Uh, called the Vici, um, but like I said, don't worry about this stuff right here so much, okay? Um, 
this is where it starts getting wild. We have Vladimir the first. Vlad is going to be a very popular Russian name. I think it's Vladimir the third or fourth, which is Vlad the Impaler, meaning he liked to stick people on sticks, which is pretty uh, horrific. And he is going to be one of the most important people. And you're going to need to know the decision he makes because you see, this guy was a powerful ruler. And we're going to see how different times were back then compared to today. Because Vlad is going to have people that practiced Islam, so Muslims are going to come to him, people that practiced Western Christianity, which we now know today as Roman Catholicism, and people who practiced Eastern Christianity, which we now know as Eastern Orthodox. Uh, and he wanted to bring all of his people together. So we thought the best way to do it would be to say, guess what? You guys are all Eastern Orthodox Christians now. So that's how it worked back then. Back then, your king or prince or ruler would say, we are all practicing this religion, okay? And then that was how it was. So he marched into town with his people, and they go and start baptizing people. They start going, and um, baptism is a, uh, it's not just Christian. I know it's fast, and that's because it's more background Nalea. So I wouldn't really worry too much about, and so this is where we need to start looking with Vlad going and forcing people to become Eastern Orthodox Christians. And basically, uh, baptism is you, um, there's different ways of doing it. You might go in a river, you might be in a tank. You might just, um, like as it is in my church, just have some water placed over your head. Um, and basically, though, this is kind of uh, your entrance into Christianity. This um, symbolic gesture of being cleansed from your sins, although the baptism isn't what does that. It's just a symbol of what Jesus did with dying on the cross. Uh, and these are the two people that you truly have to know, St. Cyril and St. Methodist. They are Greeks that are going to wind up coming in and spreading Christianity, telling the people. Because now that they're baptized, he says, so this is what this means, guys. This is how you follow it. Uh, and they're going to do something really important. They're going to invent Cyrillic um, to be able to go give them an alphabet. Because prior to this time, the people of the Kievan Rus did not have a written language. They were speaking Proto-Russian, meaning like the earliest versions of Russian, um, uh, but that was it. And so uh, they went, and as they're building churches, because now that everyone was baptized, they had to have a church to go worship in, and the rich people were told, send your sons to become priests. They invent Cyrillic, which is going to give people a new alphabet, and so that therefore people can read the Bible. All right. Like I said, I know this is fast. This is a lot of background kind of stuff. Um, and it's just one of those things that uh, we're getting through it because it's going to set the stage for our next week. Now, uh, this map right here just shows the trade. We see Kiev is on the trade routes here. We got Novgorod that we talked about earlier to the north. And we're going having lots of fur, honey. Uh, wood, things, and it's all going into Constantinople. So we're going to see the relationship between Russia and the Byzantines is going to be very, very strong. So the Cyrillic alphabet, the important thing for us today, the thing that we care about is this right here. And it's what goes and makes the Slavs have a native language. So we see Cyrillic at its you know, initial inception, like, oh, this is very similar. A looks like an A. B kind of looks like a B, but then their third letter is not a C like us. It's a V kind of sound. And boy, that looks more like a B. And then you're like, okay, what's that? Well, this, what? A G kind of sound? And this is what it looks like? So we see it's pretty different than what uh, we have. I mean, you get down here and you're going to see not even all of our sounds are the same. Like the this that kind of looks like an E with two umlauts on top. Is like a yo kind of sound. Crazy. This, which looks like a K that then is like in a mirror, like or an I and an X together, it's a z kind of sound. So this is our Cyrillic alphabet. And I know that was super duper fast, but guess what, folks? That is all we have for our notes today. Do you have any questions on any of this? I'm going to stop recording right now so that you guys can turn